Bold, and with me is Christine Nelson. Hello. And uh, just thank you so much for being here. You'll find out during this webinar that we're both intense content geeks. Uh, we know a lot about the topic. We're passionate about it. And I so appreciate when people are willing to take time out of their busy schedules to sit down and learn more about content marketing. And we'll introduce ourselves in a moment, but first I wanted to open with a cautionary tale that I think really highlights some of the trouble spots with content and content marketing. It's about a young man who uh, in his youth set out to become a great writer, like so many of us, right? And he was asked to define great. He said, you know, I want to write stuff that the whole world will read. Words that people will react to on a really emotional level. Words that will make them scream, cry, howl in pain and anger. And uh, wouldn't you know it, it turns out that he now works for Microsoft writing error messages for your computer. Oh, that's my <laughs> dream job. I know, right? I can't believe he got it and not me. So the moral of the story is you have to be aware of your content, but you also have to be aware of where it's going to end up. And we'll be talking about both aspects of that today. I know that a lot of you are familiar with Ingenuity Marketing Group. Um, some of you may not be. We are a full service marketing firm that focuses exclusively on professional services. And some of the problems that we address are competition, pushing firms into commodity pricing, um, slow or no growth, uh, getting everyone on the same page about your differentiators in the marketplace and uh, frustration with marketing programs and websites that burn money, but do not produce ROI. And it is my pleasure to introduce Christine. She's one of the senior communications consultants at Ingenuity, along with me. She is really our uh, miracle worker in the world of publicity and media. Every year she gets at least a couple of placements that we didn't think were humanly possible in addition to the many publicity placements uh, that our clients enjoy. She's a former journalist, and uh, she's won many awards for her content and for her media relations work. Um, and uh, I'll tell a little personal, can I show a little personal? She, sure. She's in color guard, so this is a very exciting season for her as she trains uh, eager young women in how to represent themselves. Yes, for street marching. If you've gone to the parades in the summer, I might be there. Thank you, Rachel. It's, it's good to be here. This is my favorite topic to speak about. And I have on my first order, order of business to introduce Rachel Gold. And Rachel has a master's in, in writing. She is a published author. So she not only promotes her own novels effectively, but she uses that market research to provide awesome ideas and implementation to our clients. She really loves to geek out on anything that has to do with technology, search engine optimization, social media. So we'll be addressing some of those things today as well. These are a few, uh, kind of an overview of the services that Ingenuity Marketing provides. And in particular for this webinar, we will talk about our coaching and communication services and our brand development and media. Because we find that content is a great way to build your brand and build the reputation of the experts in your firm or organizations. And then we work with a range of professionals, accountants across the country, attorneys, engineers, banks. We work with nonprofits, really anyone who sells what's in their heads and is interested in getting their name in lights. But enough about us. Let's talk about you. So today, we hope that your takeaways from this webinar will be an understanding of why content marketing is the number one marketing investment, 10 tips to make your content more effective. And the final tip is the one fact that if you ignore it, your content will fail. We can't really wait to get to number 10 for you on this webinar because this one fact could really make or break your content success. And um, actually, in terms of the, the tips and content marketing that we're going to share with you, we wanted to make sure that you understand our definition of content marketing, which we do define as using content to get your name in lights. One of the primary vehicles you may be familiar with is the blog, but there are also articles, guides, tips, lists, niche newsletters. And 
Our 10 tips are really designed to help you stand out from the crowd. Uh, Rachel, you might be interested in this statistic that I just saw from buyreputation.com, which is an internet marketing company. They said that there are now 152 million blogs <laughs> online and that a new blog is born every half second. I can't believe that people have that much to talk about, and yet they do. There's a lot of saturation out there, so we like to talk with our clients about how they can stand out. So as we go through these tips, I want to encourage you to ask questions at any point. You can use that questions pane over on your GoToWebinar control panel. We'll try to get to them as quickly as we can unless we see a question that we're about to cover, and then we'll, we'll hit it in that section. But we love hearing from you, so do not be shy. Shoot us questions. And speaking of questions, I wanted to ask you a question. I wanted to get a sense of um, how much your firm is using content marketing. And uh, this is a, it's an anonymous poll, so be as honest as you like. The numbers are rolling in. They are. All right, I'm going to give you all about uh, 10 more seconds if you haven't answered, and then I will show the results. All right, here we go. So you should be able to see the results. Um, and uh, the, basically, it looks like about a third of you are producing some content. Um, about a third of you are producing steady content and sharing it. A quarter of you are producing very little content marketing. Um, and 6%, and uh, some of the attendees have a lot of content. You've got it connected to calls to action. You're really leveraging content marketing very fully. It's good for us to know so that we can really position our tips for you today for yeah. that audience. All right. So now let's look at why is it that content marketing is the number one marketing investment. One of the primary reasons is that 61% uh, of customers trust custom content. And by custom, we're talking about content that's targeted towards their needs and their questions. 78% of consumers believe that content builds relationships. And you know, I'm speaking of recent statistics, uh, I saw a report recently where buyers were asked what was missing from vendor websites and articles, white papers, other content was the primary thing they said was missing. So a lot of people, when they're making a decision about uh, engaging with you and, and buying your services, they're really looking for content and they trust that. And it turns out that inbound marketing, which is basically content, is marketing that people pull towards themselves. It costs about half as much as outbound marketing, which is the more traditional um, pushed out marketing like advertising. So, you know, we've got a fair number of people who are using content marketing. Um, fewer who are doing it well. So a lot of times what happens if you've just started um, or maybe you kind of it's kind of been hit and miss is that you can find that you're creating some content but it's falling flat with your audience um, or maybe the problem's internal. You're having trouble sustaining momentum. Um, the partners at your firm, the shareholders don't feel like it's valuable. Uh, it happens a lot of the time and it doesn't mean that your content marketing is a failure. So let's get into those 10 ways to fix these problems and others. We're going to tell a short story about oh, oh yes, and it can actually be effective. Uh, so this is uh, Sykes and & Company, and they're a small accounting firm, smallish, actually, because they're growing like gangbusters, smallish, smallish, out on the East Coast. Um, and they invested in creating some really custom niche content starting a little over a year ago. We've been doing videos and video blogs, um, mainly with Allen Sykes, who's the managing partner there. And we've produced about 40 different video blogs in the last uh, probably year and a quarter. And they have at least uh, five new clients that they can track to the video blogs. Allen says he actually gets people who call him and say, we were watching your video. It was speaking right to us, and we had to call you. 
So he's getting people directly from these. And they also got uh, highlighted in the 2013 National Community Pharmacists Association Conference as an example of a vendor who was doing it right. So we wanted to start off with a strong success story, and we'll tell you a couple more as we go, to show that content is bringing in leads and prospects, and content is actually closing sales for accounting firms and for law firms. And I think the, the huge example of Allen Sykes success is that right now, obviously, they're a CPA firm. They're in busy season, and I think Allen just called you recently, right, Rachel? And he said that he had gotten some new clients yeah, he, last he, month. Or? He got uh, three of the new clients came in January. That's amazing. Well, I think what's interesting about it is, you know, January is a time where accounting firms are going into busy season, um, but other businesses are starting to feel the pain of tax time. Exactly. And they're not happy with their accountants or other professionals they might be working with. So, right. They're starting to look around. You can imagine that these people probably Googled something like pharmacy accounting, which he's now number one for, saw the videos, and then called him for help. All right, so uh, that leads us right into number one. Let's get into our first content tip here. And as you saw from the example from Allen Sykes, they are focusing on a fairly narrow niche, which is pharmacy accounting. The most effective content marketing we've found speaks to a carefully defined audience and earns their attention with information specific to them. So if you're finding in, in your firm or organization that you've not developed clear niches or practice areas, content marketing will already off the bat be a little less effective than if you are drilling down a little bit more into who those key audiences and niches are. That's the sweet spot. And uh, I have a little story to tell about this. So for example, with law firms, there are many litigators out there who are experienced enough to learn what business owners can do to stay out of court. We worked recently with an attorney in Grand Rapids who was a litigator, and he decided that his focus wanted to be on litigation prevention because he was very interested in working with business owners in particular who might have business disputes or conflicts in their arrangements. And what can they do short of going to court or suing someone, which is, is very expensive? And so we worked with this attorney to pull together some ideas on how he works with his clients on litigation prevention. Um, I interviewed him. We created these articles. And then we coached him on how he could promote the articles as a potential column or op-ed to the Grand Rapids Business Journal, so how he could reach out to the editor and present these articles. And, he was pleased to learn that the editor was very interested in, in the pieces, and after he had had a couple of articles published, he actually got a call from a judge who said, this information is exactly what I'm seeing in my courtroom and would love to not see any more, so keep writing. So right off the bat, he has a very nice referral source out there who's saying, take a look at these articles. They might be helpful. And I think this is kind of one of the top problem areas we see for people you know, what can happen with a lot of firms is maybe you have a strong commitment to doing some content marketing and you start generating content and it's too generic. You haven't really thought through deeply what that niche needs to hear from you. Um, or you're trying to create content for all of your audiences and maybe you have a lot of different practice areas and you have diverse audiences, so that makes your content very generic. Um, boring and, and very much like what people could find anywhere else on the internet. And one of the successes of the litigation prevention story and of the Sykes video story, um, he serves only independent pharmacy owners. So you can see by picking that really narrow niche, you create deeper content, you can answer exactly what people need, and you really get their attention. And maybe as an attorney, you focus on premises liability, for example, and you could pick out business owners as your general audience, or you could drill down and you could say, well, premises liability is important to manufacturers. It's also important to physicians. So, hey, let's look at some trade journals where we're really drilling to that audience and speaking specifically to them about how this issue might apply. That's how you cut through Christine's 150 billion blogs. Yes. <laughs> and Again, another challenge is you really need that expertise from your attorneys, from your engineers, from your accountants. So how do you get them to commit? 
This is a really important point when you're embarking on a content marketing strategy. Alan Sykes made the commitment to create 40 video blogs. That's a pretty serious commitment. You don't need to have that level of commitment from your experts at first. Um, but one of the things you can do is make it a little easier for them to commit and talk to them about why they should do it. And one of the things that we always say is, this will help you put your name in lights, build your credibility with prospects. You can use the content when you're having conversations with prospects, when you're meeting with referrals, and share with them an article in very simple terms that, that helps them understand what you do. We do recommend, too, as an, as an easier way to get experts to commit is to have a ghostwriter or an interview or a videographer or even a marketing person within the firm to interview the expert and develop those ideas into professional content. So Christine, we've actually got a question. Oh, OK. Uh, to, to define what we mean by experts when we say that the experts must commit. I know that not everyone wants to refer to themselves as an expert due to professional responsibility. But we use that generic term just to mean the managers in your firm, the partners, the shareholders, the associates who maybe are a little more eager about building their book of business. Um, the, the engineers mm -hmm. who have a particular specialty and they're really interested in getting the information out there because they've seen a problem over and over with their clients and they'd like to share how it could be solved. So it's approaching those people within your firm who would be really engaged and enthusiastic and even if they're busy, having some support to schedule that out a couple months ahead of time will help them also in committing. And I think we're using the, the word expert as short for the phrase subject matter expert. So, it, so it's a, the person doesn't have to be an expert across the board. They just have to be really, really good at one thing that they're willing to commit to speaking about. Writing about, and exactly, contributing. And we just pulled up this example of, of an attorney who uh, was willing to commit to writing some articles for the banking industry. She has a particular focus in banking. And so there was an opportunity to write for the Banker's Journal. And the benefit of that commitment is that now on her bio, she is able to list some of the articles that have been published. And people can link to those articles and easily find out more about her expertise and, and the information that she has shared with that audience. And we talked a little bit here about scheduling it, but the, the main thing that's important in your content marketing strategy is that you create a plan that's easy not only for you to use if you're a marketing person, but also for the professionals who've committed to support the campaign. Now the value of a scheduled out plan is that you have in your hands, in your hot little hands, accountability, the topics you plan to promote, the authors or the experts who will be developing the content, and also a strategy around how it will be promoted. So we like to think about this like as if you were a magazine publisher. And if you've ever seen a show with models out on a beach who are freezing in October, but they're doing a shoot for something that's going to come out in May or June, that's the ideal situation for your content marketing, that you're really scheduling things out, at least for your experts, two to three months ahead, and with yourselves as marketing people, you would schedule out maybe six to 12 months, ideally. It would be part of your overall marketing plan. And um, as the resident geek, I want to add here that uh, as Google has changed the way that it does online searching and the content that it pulls up for people, you may even have noticed this in your own search results, Google is appreciating evergreen content more and more, which means you know perennially interesting articles, so you write a really interesting article about some facet of tax for small businesses that's not reliant on the changing tax code year to year, but is good all the time. Those kind of evergreen articles are, they're getting more and more play on the search engines. So if you think, you know, you hear Christine saying, well, you know, do, it, do in October something for May or June, how do you know what's going to be relevant? Pick some of those evergreen topics. Pick some of those questions that you hear year in, year out from your clients that you really want to answer for them. And then you know that that content's going to be relevant whenever you run it. Correct. And you know, another example might be there are a lot of businesses looking to sell or transition their businesses. Well, that's going to be a topic of interest for the next five or 10 years. So how can your experts contribute to that dialogue and solutions? 
And I just have an example here of a simple spreadsheet. This is actually, you know, a plan that uh, involves trade magazines and general business publications. It's got kind of the idea. It's got the the deadline. It has, you know, the people who are um, assigned to the content and also the editors or contact people for the, the publication. So you can put it on a spreadsheet, a Word doc, whatever makes sense for you. It's a living document that continually is updated throughout the year. In this example, Christine, how does Dawn find the time to write so many articles? Well, again, that interview process by either a marketing person within your firm or a hired consultant or ghostwriter, it tends to really cut down on the, the time for the expert to spend. All right, so tip number four is that when you've got content out there in the world, as often as possible, you want it to point to your website. So if you're putting content out, you get an article placed somewhere, um, your guest blog, or you you're, have a blog that isn't your home website, make sure that you point back to your site because you want to send people there. Um, you want to get them engaged with your website and with your firm brand and getting used to you, getting to know you, moving themselves further along the sales cycle, and then getting in touch with you. So, uh, for example, again with the Sykes example that you saw, those videos live on their website, but they also live on YouTube. They come up in Google search results, and um, Alan and the other accountants, when they're at trade shows doing presentations, which I think they do uh, 12 or 13 trade shows a year, they really do quite a few of them, when they're out there, they're always telling people to go check out their videos, um, to go to their website, to look around at the content. And when you do that, when you have a good synergy between the content you're creating and the content on your website, then there's more for people to do and they get to know you better. And I have another case study here for you. So this is Ostvig Tree Care. Um, yes, they actually do tree care. And they're a great company, but their website a couple, I think it was just about a year ago, a little over a year ago, was getting almost no traffic. It was basically one of those billboard websites, like, hi, we're here. Here's a few things about us. So we helped them put up this blog. And the blog is primarily actually written by Ingenuity Marketing, because especially during their busy season, when they're out trimming trees, they do not have time to write blog posts. They'll occasionally take a photo for us and send it back to us. So there's a good interplay between the information that they give us, what's hot, what topics we should pursue, and our ability to write this blog for them. So they went from having a website that had almost no traffic um, to now they get hundreds of visitors per month, up to 900 a month during their busy season. And the time on site is going up. So now people are, they're not just coming to the site, looking up the phone number and leaving. They're spending two to three minutes on the site, and they're generally looking at four or five pages. So having a lot of content for them to look at helps them spend more time thinking about using Ostvig as their tree care provider. And Ostvig, it's a good model professional services wise because they work with a lot of, of people who own estates or campuses or managing campuses. So it's not necessarily end consumers, it's people who are running businesses where they've got trees that need care on their estates. So the more they can bring people in, have them understand that they are the thought leaders, um, the more they're having these year after year, long term, large relationships. Which uh, brings up a, a side point actually, Rachel, when you have a website that's easy to navigate, yes. such as Ostvigs, that also supports visitors staying longer on your site. So checking out your navigation when you're strategizing on your content marketing plan will also be an important factor in your effectiveness. All right, tip number five, hashtag keywords. Um, that was my little joke to talk both about hashtags and keywords. So the hashtag is the pound symbol that you see in front of the word keywords there. And it's mostly popularized among Twitter users, but we're starting to see it hit other social media networks as well, social networks. <laughs> so understanding the words that people are using to find you, which are your keywords and sometimes hashtags, that will help you both write content that has the keywords in it, but it can also help you figure out which content to write. 
So on the next page, I'll show you. This is from the Google AdWords tool. It's free to use. Uh, I think you need a Google account to access it, but once you do that, you can go in, put your website in, and you put in some basic keywords, and it will suggest ideas, and then you'll see over kind of on that numeric column in the middle how many people are looking for it. So maybe uh, I deal with entrepreneurs in my business, and I want to look for some topics that would get their attention. Here I can see that angel investors is searched for an awful lot. So I might write some articles that pertain to that because I know that's a hot topic. And whatever your niche is, whatever your practice areas are, for example, you can go and put in words and see what Google suggests and what the keyword ideas are. And sometimes you'll find that there's a topic that you think is really hot, but no one's talking about it the way you thought they were. We actually found a while back that one of the key phrases that was very popular but not used by a lot of websites at the time was how to choose a CPA. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds like a great topic to me to have on your website. How do you choose a CPA? What are the steps you go through? You're immediately drawing people into your website yeah. from that, that key phrase that they're searching for. And those kinds of questions are actually more and more popular now that people are using mobile devices more to search. You know, people will ask a question into their phone. So those kinds of how to, how do I kinds of articles can be very, very valuable. So you're either generating articles from keywords or maybe you've already got the idea for the article and you're just going to put some of your keywords in it. You don't want to overdo it. You just want to use a couple. Um, Sorry, we got a question here and we have a we have a sound issue. Okay, so including a couple of keywords in with your content and I would say you definitely don't want to use more than say two key phrases per article, even if it's a pretty long article because Google will ding you if you use too many of them. Um, but using a couple of them can help the search engines understand what your firm is expert in. So helping your content creators understand what your keywords are can just make that more valuable for your firm. Um, okay, I have a question here. So uh, in terms of what we're looking at, am I saying that this is a Google tool to check for keywords? Yes, that is exactly what I'm saying. Thank you for asking. Is it, it, if you Google, Google AdWords, or it, it used to be called the Google Keyword Tool, and they folded it into AdWords, but you can still find it by searching for Google Keyword Tool. So either uh, search for that or search for Google AdWords. It's free. You have a Google account. You can actually connect it to your Google Analytics. And what you do is it just asks you what your ideas are. You put those in, and then it generates a list exactly like what you're looking at on the screen now that gives you other ideas tells you how often they're being searched for, and um, tells you the competition. So ideally, you want a high search number and a medium to low competition number. It's one of my favorite things, the Google Keyword Tool. So if anyone has more questions, email me afterwards, and I'll be happy to help you out. All right, and I want to say that you should definitely make sharing easy. So sometimes, we see firms that are generating really juicy content. It's long, it's meaty, it's niche focused. Um, it goes up on the website, nobody ever hears about it, and it makes us very sad. Yes. Yes. So ideally, you want sharing tools on your website um, so that you can, you know, people can click to like it, to share it, to tweet it. But another thing that we do internally that we find really useful is we actually send an email around the office telling people when something's gone up on LinkedIn, Facebook, so that they can reshare it. Because what happens is uh, if your firm posts something on LinkedIn in the morning and you don't even get to LinkedIn that day because you only check it on Fridays, you're not going to see that news by the time you get there. It's going to have gone past in your news feed. So sending an actual physical email around can help internally people at your firm share more often. So that could be either a partner who's just published an article, maybe wants to just share with everyone, hey, I thought everyone should know, 
that this has been published, you might like to take a look at it, circulate it, or you work with marketing people internally and they will put together a post that everyone can just cut and paste into their personal social media profiles or send out to clients. And we have an example here for you from BKR International. And what I thought was great about this example is that BKR International is creating a status update about their members being quoted in another source. So they're using their networks and their social media to draw attention to an outside article, which just increases their credibility. Because when you, whenever you have an article in another publication, of course, it's huge credibility. And you can see down here that people can like it, they can comment on it, they can share it. So I was curious at this point to kind of run another quick poll. Uh, we've, we've talked about a lot of things so far, and I wanted to get a feel for um, what you want your content to be doing for you as we roll into our second half of the tips. And you can choose more than one of these, because I know that some of you have more than one of these as a goal. But, but of these, what are the most important? Is it sending people to your website? Is it getting your brand out there? What really is top of your list? All right, I'm going to give you about 10 more seconds. All right. Excellent, just as suspected. Lead generation. Yeah, so you are seeing the results, I hope. Um, and it came out that uh, the top one is lead generation client acquisition at 67%. Then uh, brand awareness, then website traffic, thought leadership, and customer retention. And I picked these uh, specifically because they were actually done as part of a poll from the Content Marketing Institute for 2014 top organizational goals for B2B content marketing. And I have to say that uh, you guys are pretty on point about what, what the concerns of all marketers are that it tends to be that kind of lead generation brand awareness is really top of the list. Um, and then the website traffic, retention, and thought leadership kind of uh, trailing behind a little bit, but still really important. And, and they're, they're aligned with each other, certainly, because you want to be seen as thought leaders, which then ties into your lead generation and client acquisition. Definitely. For sure. All right, number thank seven. You. Well, thank you for participating in the polls. It, it gives us a real sense that what we're seeing is what you're seeing as well. Our, our tip here, number seven, is to tell your readers, your visitors, your viewers what to do next. Effective content marketing, as Rachel mentioned, gets people to stay longer on your website, to read more, and to look for more. So you want to make sure that your content is set up to tell them what to do next. And this is one of the biggest missed opportunities that we see in the creation of content, that it's left hanging out there all by itself, rather than linking it to related content or giving them a call to action at the end of an article. It might even be just something as simple as, if you're having problems with this, talk to legal counsel. Or if you're having problems with, with this issue, here's an association or here's a link that you should go to. It just really gives them a sense of what they can do next, but then it also hopefully ties into additional content that you've created that they can read more about. You're really going above and beyond your reader's expectations, and you're convincing them that no one else knows their stuff like you do. So we brought up an example here of the Bailey Group. They are an organization who works with CEOs, and um, helps them to understand their leadership skills and how that ties into their senior leadership group, talent management, organizational management overall. And so they have a blog on their website. And as you see on the bottom of the blog, they have different options for people to use once they've read this blog. And what we'll find sometimes with blogs is that someone will spend a couple minutes on that page and then they go away. We don't want that to happen. We actually want them to move through your website into additional information. So whether they go to a previous blog that's listed 
or the next blog, or maybe they click into a service that you're offering that's linked within the blog. Those are little tricks and tips that you can use to keep them on your website longer and looking at your content. And even something as simple as a, a newsletter sign-up window will give them a, a chance, an opportunity to get more content from you. We were going to tell a little embarrassing story about ourselves here, and by ourselves I mean ingenuity, uh, kind of a cobbler's children going without shoes story, because you'll <laughs> you see we put up our new website recently, and then we were looking at the Google Analytics to see what the behavior was of people on the site, and we noticed that uh, they would come in, spend a couple minutes, and then exit. And sometimes they were only looking at one page, and then we realized we had forgot to put calls to action at the end of our own pages. And so right. this is the kind of thing that you can see, you know, if you're keeping track of your analytics, you can see in the behavior if you don't have enough of these moving people around your website. Ideally, you want people to be looking at multiple pages um, and spending, you know, ideally two to four minutes or longer on your website. And speaking of metrics. And, and your website can be a living document like that. I mean, we know that we can't cover every single eventuality with a website because it is so dynamic and the technology is changing so quickly that it, it can be part of your phase two, your phase three, your ongoing website improvement. And the, the real goal here is to be able to track what you've created. And so you perhaps will have your, your Google Analytics on your website, or you will use the analytics on social media to see who is looking at your information, who sh you know, how many people are sharing it, how many people are liking it. And really, the goal for you as marketing people is to convince the unconvinced, in a way. By having some real numbers behind your most popular content, you're really showing that something is critical within an audience you're trying to reach. And you can tie that then into sales conversations. So you might find out that through your tracking that, you know, wow, cost segregation is really a hot topic right now with our audience. You know, maybe we should be talking about this with our prospects. And so providing that information into the sales cycle really not only supports you in marketing and knowing what to generate next for content, but also to know what to speak about with your audiences. And this is where a lot of content marketing efforts kind of uh, lose the wind out of their sails, because what happens is you produce some wonderful content, you put it out in the world, you think you're doing everything right, and then you hear nothing. Because what's happening is uh, sales might actually be happening, but they're forgetting to tell you about it. I have a wonderful story. A friend of mine is a content marketing expert on the West Coast working with enterprise applications. So huge software, you know, million dollar implementations for large businesses. And there was a client that one of her companies was trying to land, and they just could not get the decision maker to get on the phone with them. And then one day he actually called one of their sales guys and said, hey, when are you in my town next? I want to take you to lunch. And the guy, the guy who was pretty smart said, oh, I'm there tomorrow. So he goes to lunch with this decision maker, and the decision maker actually pulled out of his briefcase a printed out article that this content marketing expert had written for this company put it on the table and said, tell me what that implementation will look like in my company. And it, it moved the sales cycle ahead tremendously. But the problem is most of the time your prospects are not printing out the articles. You know, they're, they're not always coming into a meeting saying, oh, I read a bunch of stuff on your website and I loved it, so I thought I would call you. They usually lead with what their pain is rather than how much they liked your content. I mean, occasionally, like in Allen's case, he does actually have prospects who call him and say, I love your videos, I need to work with you. But you have to remind your business development people from time to time, hey, did anyone mention our content? Is there anything specifically that's working for people? And you also have to kind of dig into your analytics, um, both in the social media and on your website, to see what's popular and see what's holding people's attention. And if you have a niche newsletter, for example, you can just take a look at it every so often and see if it's really doing for you what it, you want it to do. Um, are these topics really resonating with people? You know, whether that's just talking with a client, hey, did you get our last newsletter? What did you think of it? Just doing some informal polling can give you a sense of whether your content's on point or not. And I just brought this up as an example. The LinkedIn company pages 
are great. Um, as an administrator of the company page, you will actually be able to view how many people saw the page and the information, how many clicked through with this example at the webinar. Well, we had four people click through to the webinar. Um, and then the, the percentage of engagement. So these numbers give you a great idea of whether this content is popular. Can it be potentially repurposed into some other content with the same topic for um, a wider audience? Are you saying we should repurpose it? We should repurpose it. See how these segues work? It's great. Uh, and Rachel and I, we put this tip in and we laugh because we have been talking about this tip for the last seven years at least that if you are going to, as a firm, take non-billable time, effort to create beautiful content, why only use it once? Try to use it in multiple ways. So if it was originally intended as a newsletter article, why can't you pitch that topic out to a trade journal? Why can't you turn it into a speech? Maybe it's a webinar opportunity. Um, it's, it's just wonderful when you have a chance to share things multiple times and the benefit of it is that people need to hear things multiple times before they will act. So we, we always recommend that it's not only used multiple times if it's a hot topic, but also it's shown and posted in multiple places, your website, your social media. It's also a great way to show extra value for partners and shareholders who might kind of drag their heels at the idea of using that much non-billable time to create content. You know, if they take the time to create a really good article, knowing that it, it can show up in summary form somewhere else, that it might show up somewhere as a fancy infographic, it really it helps them see the value of taking some time to get a great article in place in the first place. And before we get to number 10, our big reveal with number 10, we just wanted to show you an overview of how we think about the content marketing process. We're recapping the first nine tips here. So your research would be picking your niches, getting your internal experts on board, and deciding on the media channels where you most want to be seen. Definitely on your website, but also social media, traditional daily newspapers and business journals, trade sites. Your next step is looking at strategy. This is the piece where you're brainstorming topic ideas, you're interviewing your experts either internally or through a hired consultant or ghostwriter to find out what their clients, their clients are most concerned about in determining your content, so making sure it's really relevant for that target audience. Your plan is your editorial calendar, scheduling out your experts to contribute the content, and actually creating the content on the deadlines you need them to create it. And execution, pulling the trigger, coaching your experts on working with the media, using social media to promote your content, communicating with editors and organizations who will publish the content for you. And then finally, measurement, which is, this is the art really to the whole process. It's using what you've learned to show the value of content marketing and taking the most popular topics to create new content and improve your sales questions when meeting with prospects. So you might say, you know, we've heard from our clients that one of the biggest challenges in mergers and acquisitions is X. And you've learned that because you know that that topic you've written about is really hot on your, on your measurement. All right, so uh, in our wind up for tip number 10, we just wanted to remind you of these statistics. So this is one reason that it's really important to do content marketing because of the trust and the relationships and the decreased cost. But here is the, here's our big secret. The whole goal of content marketing is to nurture leads and to support a shorter sales cycle. Your content marketing from the firm's view is entirely about new business. Now that may seem obvious, but it is so often missed when people look at content marketing. You need to align your content with your firm's sales strategy, and you want to use it to shorten the sales cycle so that you're closing new business faster. So the bottom line is, your content should work like you have an extra salesperson or an extra business development person in your office. We use the word salesperson here because it fit on the slide, but 
<laughs> however you do business development, you want to clone one of those people, a really good person, and that's how you want to put your content to work for you. You want content that is inviting and attracts people in and warms them up as prospects so that as they're moving through their decision making in that sales cycle, um, that content is really, it's pushing them and it's educating them. And when your actual human business development people get into conversations with them, they're closer to the end point than they would have been if they had not read your content. They're, so, they're much warmer. Much yes. warmer, yes. Yeah. So we wanted to show you, this is a, a picture of the buying cycle. So one way that you do this is you think about the buying cycle when you're creating content. And I'm going to start in that upper left-hand phase, discover. Um, and a lot of times, we only write for, for this phase. <laughs> it's all about, oh, let's, let's hear about different approaches to this you know, facet of accounting or, or law. You know, let's talk about problems and solutions in kind of a general way. It's that really kind of general content. And then you want to think about, okay, once people get their big questions answered and once they're clear that as a firm we could serve them, then they're really exploring, like, what are the possible solutions to my problem? What are the business cases? This is where you use case studies. You really give examples of how your firm has, has helped other clients. Um, you do some very deeply focused how-to kinds of articles um, where by the time they get to the end of the how-to article, they realize they can't possibly do it themselves and they have to call you. Um, so you really go deeper in that phase. And then when they go into that buying phase, you want some content that shows your firm's brand in an emotional way so that you connect with their subconscious decision making and you stand out from the others. So here, again, you might talk about things your firm has done well. You might show off the culture of your firm, what your firm is committed to. And you show off the thought leadership of your experts so they see why your experts are head and shoulders above those in other firms to really push them to choose you. And then you don't let them drop there. You want to engage them after they've become clients. And you want to give them content that they can share so that they can drive other leads to your firm as well. So when you think about the whole buying cycle, that's when you really start to employ your content and turn it into that extra business development person in your firm. And in addition to uh, hiring your content, sometimes you also have to actually hire people to write your content. So we wanted to give you this cool checklist of all the things that we look at when we're looking at what is really expert content. I mean, Christine and I, I've been here seven years. You've been here uh, almost 10. Yes. So we've had a lot of time to look at content and to look at what works. And this is how we boil it down. Um, it's that you, the writing is clear and effective, and that's kind of the bottom line, that we understand the industry jargon and that anyone you have creating your content can understand the jargon but not use it because most of your audience doesn't understand that jargon. So you need someone who can translate it into plain English. You want to look for people, or if you're doing it yourself, make sure that you're writing for search engines, write for your keywords, get those in there. Um, and then write in a way that's really engaging because apparently there are 500 billion blogs in the world and everyone- 152 oh. million. <laughs> yes. And people are busy. So if you don't make it easy for them to pay attention, if you don't make it engaging, they're going to tune it out. So you have to write at that engaging level. And then uh, your content writer has to understand how to use calls to action and move them along the sales cycle. And when you have those last couple pieces in there, that's when your content really goes to work for you as part of your business development team. All right, we've said a lot, uh, to, and uh, oh, we have questions. Wonderful. Okay, so are web pages themselves considered content marketing? For example, on a family law website, pages about divorce, custody, etc. cetera. Uh, we find that content on your website should definitely be written for humans as well as the robots, such as the Google, the Google search engines that will crawl your site to look for relevance to their key phrases. Um, 
So that is definitely very important, but we would not define the copy on a service page, for example, as content marketing. What we would probably say would be content marketing is if there is a newsletter people can download from that web page that's also related to the service offering, um, if there's a blog related to it, if there's an article an attorney has written and that's found on the attorney's bio, that would be considered a, a form of, of content marketing because it's, it's actually inviting people to learn more about you, to go deeper, as Rachel was saying, and it's the buying process. I think it's a tough one because, you know, in a way, the, the service area of a website is technically not content marketing, but a blog on the website is, or the news pages are. Um, so you could say we're splitting hairs here, but I think that I think one of the relevant things also is um, in content marketing, you're producing content with some regularity. So if you just created your website and left it alone for a couple of years, I wouldn't call that content marketing. But if you have a website and you're also producing articles on some regular basis, I would say that what's on your website is part of your well, it's part of your part of your strategy. content package yeah. because really without a high quality website to showcase your content, it's another way that it can be potentially ineffective because you want people attracted to your website when they arrive so that they're interested in exploring. It would be terribly sad to have spent a lot of money and time on great content marketing and have a website that turns people off. Right. That would make me cry. Right. Any other questions? Okay, do we have some tips on how to incorporate calls to actions in videos? Um, there, are, there are some different, uh, there are a number of different options, which include if the video is embedded as part of a, like a blog post, that's how we're doing it on the Sykes site, and it's not as great as we want it to be, so we're going to be putting some changes in soon about that. But if you're putting, if you're embedding it in a blog, you can include links above or below the videos. If you enjoy this video, try this video. So that's one thing. Um, you'll see on the newer Sykes videos, the, actually the last pane of the video, like the last probably six seconds, is um, Alan's email and his direct dial number. And there's a, a direct, my voice saying, if you have any questions, please call Alan directly. So that if people feel they got to know him through the videos, they can actually just pick up the phone and call him, and he loves when that happens. Um, and it, you can also, depending on who, who's doing the video, for you and their level of expertise, you can embed links in videos. So you can have the video have a link at the end, depending on where that is going. Um, and when you're uploading videos to YouTube, you can create your own text. So you can have links in that text as well, linking back to your website or, or suggesting other things that people might click through. So those would be my top four video call to action, calls to action. Three or four good tips. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Show, shall we show them our last couple slides? And we have time for about one more question, but we're going to kind of barrel on. So just uh, sneak your question in, and we'll get to it in a moment. All right, so we just wanted to show this slide as, again, talking about content marketing as being part of the growth foundation of firms and organizations. So you want to look at not only the sales process, but how you're retaining clients through your content, how you're promoting your firm and your niche reputation, how you're supporting lead generation for additional new clients, and lead nurturing when they're getting ready to buy. So it's just kind of an overview of, of how content is part of this whole process in growing your firm and organization. Um, and we did get another question. Can we get a copy of it? Yes, you totally can, because we actually remember to record ourselves. So <laughs> we're going to post both a PDF of this presentation along with the video up on our website. And I believe uh, we'll send you out in the next day or two an email with a link to that. So you'll get both the video and the PDF. And speaking of us and our content marketing. Well, another example of content marketing, if you wanted to take a look at how we do it at Ingenuity, we've recently redesigned our quarterly newsletter, which is called Ingenious Review. And we have done a lot of work on not only the redesign, but also in leaving the breadcrumbs of content marketing to lead people from the newsletter articles to additional content on our website, on our Ingenious blog, and to videos, to, to different types of things that relate to the content in the newsletter. So that's going to be developing throughout the year. 
And if you contact Melissa Trost in our office, she can put you on our newsletter list and you can use that as a potential example in your own strategy. You can also sign up on our website. And uh, so speaking of us, this is how you can get in touch with us. Um, Christine is brilliant at answering all media related questions and I am the uh, backroom SEO geek. So if you have questions about Google Analytics or Google Keywords, just shoot me an email. Uh, we've got our Twitter handles up there too if you want to tweet us. And I'm, I'm actually at virtual PR girl, so we can, we can change that and adjust it before we send out the webinar uh, slides for you. But feel free to email us anytime and we're, we're happy to talk over whatever questions you have. And thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, it's been great to have you. You were a very active audience, which we appreciate. We love the questions. And so we hope that you have a wonderful afternoon and get to wow people in your firm with some of the content marketing tips that you have picked up today. Thank you. Thank you.